And so I'm just here to introduce this session and the presidents who are going to be uh, speaking during this session. Um, just like the ACU PCC is an historic initiative, um, the opportunity to hear directly from your presidents or presidential um, representatives of the initiative is a really um, kind of unique opportunity. So I encourage you all to be thinking as they go through their introductions of the kind of questions that you could ask a president a question about sustainability or, or other issues that you're facing, um, that you think about those and, and pose those questions uh, to these presidents when we come to the question and answer session. Um, so we have uh, four presidents who will be speaking today, and I'm going to uh, read through their, their biographies because they're, um, they have wonderful long histories in academia and, and in sustainability. Uh, President Crow, president of our host institution, Arizona State University. Um, he became the, Michael Crow became the 16th president of Arizona State University in 2002. He is guiding the transformation of Arizona State University into one of the nation's leading public metropolitan research universities, an institution combining academic excellence, <coughs> inclusiveness, and societal impact, a model he terms the new American university. Under his leadership, ASU has established major interdisciplinary research initiatives such as the Biodesign Institute, GEOS, the Global Institute of Sustainability, and more than a dozen new transdisciplinary schools. And it's witnessed an unprecedented academic infrastructure expansion, near tripling of research expenditures, and attainment of record levels of diversity in the student body. He was previously executive vice provost at Columbia University, where he served as chief strategist of Columbia's research enterprise and technology transfer operations. A fellow of the National Academy of Public Administration, a member of the Council on Foreign Relations and the U.S. Department of Commerce National Advisory Council on Innovation and Entrepreneurship. He's the author of books and articles analyzing science and technology policy and the design of knowledge enterprises. President Crow received his doctorate in public administration, science and technology policy from the Maxwell School of Citizenship and Public Affairs, Syracuse University in 1985. And I'm gonna go ahead and just introduce all four presidents and then um, let them tell you a little bit about the, the work they're doing. Um, so we also have President Jan Geller from Scottsdale Community College, also right here in the neighborhood. Um, president Geller became the second president of Scottsdale Community College on July 1st, 2008. She came to Maricopa Community College District with 21 years in higher education. Dr. Geller held rank as Associate Professor in Culinary Arts and Hospitality and served in management positions from Chair to Associate Dean, Interim Dean, Interim Provost, and for nine years as the Dean of the University of Alaska Anchorage Community and Technical College. She taught high school and served as a grant writer for six years with the Orange Unified School District in California and continued her professional public service as faculty and external degree program coordinator at California State University, Long Beach, followed by 12 years as a senior health and human services planner with the municipality of Anchorage. She earned a bachelor's degree in family and consumer science from Ohio State University, a master's in vocational education from California State University, Long Beach, and a doctorate in educational planning from Oregon State University. Our next president is President John Hager, Northern Arizona University, just a few hours up the road. Um, and President Hager has been president of NAU since November 2001, after joining the university to serve as NAU provost in June 2000. He leads NAU in its commitment to undergraduate education a commitment enhanced by the university's ongoing efforts in research, graduate education, and distance learning. During his term as president, Dr. Hager has guided the university to new heights in student enrollment in Flagstaff and across the state, answering the call from the governor's office and the state legislature to make higher education accessible and affordable to all Arizona citizens. Dr. Hager is a member of the Translational Genomics Research Institute Board of Governors, TGEN, um, the Greater Phoenix Leadership, Arizona Commerce Authority, American College and University President's Climate Commitment Steering Committee, Chair of the AAC SCU Committee on International Education, and the Flagstaff 40. 
He is a former member of the Arizona State Board of Education, former chair of the United Way of the Northern Arizona Board, former commissioner for the Western Interstate Commission for Higher Education, and is past chair of the Big Sky Conference President's Council. Dr. Hager has worked at all levels of higher education, professor, chair, dean, vice president, and provost. Early in Dr. Hager's career, he conducted and published articles and books on the theme of economic change and how it affects individuals and institutions. He was founding editor of the Michigan Historical Review, and his work on the investment frontier won a national award from Choice Magazine, um, as well as his book on John Astor, argued for Astor's role as the first modern American venture capitalist. Dr. Hager earned his bachelor's, his master's, and his doctoral degrees from Loyola University in Chicago. And we have our out-of-state representative in President David Schmidley from the University of New Mexico. Uh, president Schmidley was installed as the 20th president of the University of New Mexico in October 2007. As president, he is responsible for the University of New Mexico campuses in Gallup, Los Alamos, Taos, Valencia, and Rio Rancho, as well as the UNM Health Sciences Center, which includes a nationally renowned UNM Cancer Center. President Schmidley brings a wealth of knowledge and experience to UNM, having led Oklahoma State University as its system CEO and president from 2002 to 2007. In addition to his work at OSU, he was previously the president of Texas Tech University after having served as vice president for research, graduate studies, and technology transfer, and as dean of the graduate school. He also spent 25 years at Texas A&M University, including five years as CEO on the Galveston campus and six years as head of the Department of Wildlife and Fishery Science. During his tenure in New Mexico, UNM has seen major growth in the incoming freshman class and significant accomplishments in the recruitment of national merit and national Hispanic scholars. As well, the university has seen a renewed sense of purpose surrounding undergraduate and graduate education, diversity, research, creating healthy New Mexico communities, as well as economic and community development. President Schmidley is an internationally respected researcher and scientific author and has been inducted into the Texas Hall of Fame for science, and mathematics, and technology. And this recognizes individuals who have played a major role in significant scientific accomplishments. As a noted scientific naturalist, he has authored nine natural history and conservation books about mammals and more than 100 scientific articles. Dr. Schmidley earned a doctorate in zoology from the University of Illinois following his bachelor's and master's degrees from Texas Tech. This is a wonderful um, group of presidents that you're going to get to hear from, and I will turn it over to President Crow. Thank you. <clears throat> Can everybody hear me all right back there in the back? Well, why don't I start by uh, contextualizing what I hope will be uh, an open uh, conversation. Uh, yes. Whatever that was. You hear those noises and you think, well, maybe that whole thing about the aliens is correct. <laughs> They're coming in. And so <laughs> uh, you're in uh, the oldest building on our uh, university campus. This is, uh, this is the facility that was the uh, Arizona Territorial Teachers Academy uh, before uh, 1900. Uh, and you're in the main uh, room of that particular uh, facility. And this was an institution built around the notion of teaching. We are a teacher's college. We grew up from being a teacher's college. We later grew 15 other colleges beyond our teacher's college, but, but we're a teacher's college. And probably all of us in the room in one way or another, if you simplify what we do, this is certainly true for me when people ask me what I am, I always say the same thing, I'm a teacher. I'm a teacher. That's what I do. There's other people that are doctors, other people that are lawyers, other people that are business people, other people that are whatever they are. I'm a teacher. And what do teachers do in the 21st century going forward? Well, it's not like they used to do in the past. You have to, you have to be, uh, in many cases, at, at the university level, a teacher has to be capable of creating knowledge and synthesizing, synthesizing knowledge and advancing knowledge. But I think more important than that, <coughs> the institutions themselves have to teach. And so several years ago, ASU became involved in uh, 
getting the whole President's climate commitment uh, uh, going. And uh, Jim Beiser, who was on our staff at that time, was, uh, was uh, uh, a fantastic driving energy force both inside ASU and outside ASU to get this whole thing going. And we joined and have, have uh, maintained our membership and our commitment to climate uh, uh, neutrality, to uh, carbon neutrality, whatever you want to call it. Uh, we joined because we think that, and thought then and think now, that as teachers we've done a poor job. When you see rancorous political debate about scientific knowns, and you see people denigrating science, and you see people saying, oh, that's not happening, it's all, it's all made up, you know, global warming has no chance of actually ever occurring, I'm like, uh, that's wrong. And so uh, uh, it may be caused by different things. It may be moving in different directions. There may be all kinds of factors, which is certainly the case. But it began to sink into me that we'd done a pretty poor job of teaching. And I don't mean teaching just by in the classroom, and I don't mean teaching just by uh, research. I mean teaching as an institution. And so we joined up with these other colleges and hundreds of other colleges and universities around the country to see if there were ways in which we could teach not only by what we teach, but also by what we do. Is there a way for us to restructure our own ways in which we consume or use energy or uh, produce carbon or don't produce carbon, and can we find a way to teach on multiple levels? Can we express as an institution, in addition to expressing to our students? Can we basically say, well, don't tell us that it can't be done. Don't tell us that you can't build buildings in the right way or that you can't manage all of your solid waste or that you can't do these things or you can't lower your carbon footprint. Because if the teachers can't figure that out, who can? Remember, the teachers are supposed to be the ones who are storing knowledge and synthesizing knowledge and advancing knowledge and figuring out ways to do things. So sitting here in this old teacher's college, this old teacher's academy, if whatever we are today, 100 plus years later, if we can't figure it out, who can? Obviously, if it's left only to the quote unquote scientists, that's insufficient. Science is one thing, and many teachers are scientists, but science is not enough. It has to be taught. Why do we need to manage our carbon footprint? Why do we need to manage our path to either sustainable or non-sustainable coexistence with nature. Teachers have to figure out how to get people to learn, how to get people to understand. And it's always important, and I sort of offer this as, a, as an opening comment to the, to the panel. You know, when you see people running around saying some of the things that they say uh, about climate futures, or when you see people running around, uh, uh, you know, wondering, you know, why, whether or not we should be concerned that we're not necessarily on the path to sustainability or you've got 70,000 synthetic chemicals uh, in the uh, water and air uh, media of the planet that are now integrating themselves into us and every other species on the planet. Do those things make any difference? We only know if they make any difference if you've been taught. There's actually no way to derive that understanding on your own. It's actually we're sort of past the notion of you know, look at the tree and have someone teach you about the tree, and then therefore you'll understand all things. We're just past that. As powerful as that kind of teaching logic can be, the teaching logic of today needs to be that, plus how do we deal with global sustainability, plus how do we build our cities, plus how do we express new ways of thinking to have the planet operate with uh, between 7 and 10 billion people, or however many people we, we end up with. How do you teach all of that? So the, the question I'd throw out for each of the presidents that are up here, and I hope that we can get to uh, questions from you all, uh, uh, is how do you teach sustainability, or how do you teach about climate change, or how do you teach about responsible management of the relationship between the built environment and the natural environment? And I'll take whoever wants to go first. Go ahead, David. David, oh, go ahead. David then Jan. Can everyone hear? I think I'm the problem with the, here comes a young man, maybe adjust this. How's that? Can everyone hear okay now? Good. Um, 
I, I guess what I want to do is take your excellent introduction and maybe offer a few comments about the role that a university president might make. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, like you, uh, view myself as a teacher. Uh, that's why I got into, uh, why I got a PhD. I, I never wanted to be a university president. I wanted to be a scholar and a teacher. Right. I became a university president. And the, the question of what role have I tried to play, I obviously can't teach every student on the campus. But I feel like uh, as a presidential leader, you can do the necessary things so that the kinds of issues that Michael raised become part of the, the pedagogy on the entire campus and the way in which the campus operates as an example to the students and to the public for how to, um, um, how to exist with a, a, a paradigm of sustainability, climate neutrality, carbon neutrality, et cetera, et cetera. So when I became president of the University of New Mexico in um, 2007, we did one of the things that almost all new presidents to do. We engaged in a reexamination of, of uh, mission, uh, vision, and our core principles. And out of that, sustainability emerged as one of the most important core principles on the campus. And so we began to, in all of our planning and all of our activities, academic, non-academic, we began to evaluate how do we do this in a way that teaches and fosters sustainability. So I see that as one of the major roles of a president. Uh, but I would also say uh, presidents, uh, in terms of authority, for the most part, have the bully pulpit and not much else. You've got faculty senate, staff councils, student government, uh, alumni, the legislature, the stakeholders go on and on and on. And so it's, you have to have a lot of help. You have to have a lot of champions on the campus. And uh, I've been very fortunate in that regard. When this sustainability as a core principle emerged, the champions began to emerge. Uh, Bruce Milne here is a professor of biology, and he runs our, um, our academic initiative for undergraduates and graduate students in sustainability. And Bruce holds the Kellogg Chair in Sustainability. Mary Clark in the back of the room is, uh, on our, is president of our staff council, and she is the uh, sustainability program specialist on the campus. Mary Vosovich, Mary, raise your hand, is the director of the physical plant. We, uh, some of our biggest teaching moments have been in how we manage our physical plant. And Jason Strauss is the manager of our incredibly successful uh, energy conservation program. Now, I, I've had a chance to talk with my colleagues up here. We've all faced one big dilemma the last few years. Uh, we've lost about 20, 22 percent of our budget at the University of New Mexico, the same time our enrollment has gone up 15 percent, and we've had almost no tuition increases. So what we found is sustainability can be useful teaching, not only in a, in a paradigm of how to be a better citizen. We have found that uh, sustainability is good business, and it's a good way to contain costs and save money, and it's helped us balance our budgets. Uh, our energy conservation program in a couple of years has saved over $8 million. Uh, we operate our entire campus in Taos on, uh, on a solar grid. Uh, we are uh, retrofitting our buildings. Almost everything we build now is at least silver platinum. Uh, we have donors that have begun to help us, donating uh, the, the money we need to operate some of our new buildings uh, with solar. Um, transportation systems. We have tremendously reduced the number of people that drive cars to the campus by entering into a program with the city of Albuquerque where faculty, students, and staff get free bus passes, and we're encouraging people to come and go from the campus in ways that are more sustainable. This not only helps the university, we haven't given any salary increases in four years. It helps every single one cope with the, the, the great economic recession. So uh, I think sustainability, yes, 
it is the responsibility of teachers to teach it. It's also the responsibility of a university campus to practice it and be an example that students and people beyond the campus can see as a real world living example of how to operate a sustainable enterprise. And I think we've made a lot of progress at the University of New Mexico. By no means have we mined every, all the possibilities. We've not achieved that. But I feel really good that we have it going on two parallel tracks. The sort of non-academic culture of the institution, the business practices of the institution, and thanks to Bruce's leadership, the academic aspect of the institution. And every day you see the students, you, you can see them through their actions. They're learning more and more, and I think we are teaching them. And that's, those would be my comments, okay. Michael. Uh, Jan? Well, thank you. Um, I would echo David's comments, absolutely. The short answer to your question is, uh, whether you are, one is a president or a VP or a member of the faculty, you must, we must model the way. And as David says, we have the bully pulpit when folks will listen to us. And so we must be committed to the issues or the resolving the issues and the challenges of sustainability. We must be conversant in what that means, both theoretically as well as practically. And on a college campus, whether it's a community college or four-year college or a university, of course, that divides into uh, the teaching and learning and student services, as well as, as David mentioned, the facilities folks. So there are many opportunities to apply the principles that we are going to or we do espouse. Um, I want to give a bit of a pitch to the, uh, uh, on behalf of the Maricopa Community College District, you all, or many of you may know, it's 250,000 students, about 8,000 employees, 10 fully accredited and separately accredited colleges. So it's a big organization. And to his credit, Rufus Glasper, who is our chancellor, about uh, two years ago, uh, signed, he, he followed the lead of five of the presidents in the system who were early signatories and was committed to uh, the, the climate commitment, signed on behalf of the entire district. And with that, convinced our governing board to adopt uh, a policy statement on behalf of uh, the importance of sustainability. Uh, that cascaded from turning a planning task force across the district into a true sustainability action council at the highest level and it translated a lot of uh, intensive but disparate work that was going on at the colleges into a unified march forward. And so we really have appreciated being part of the climate commitment. On the campus level, um, it's, it is a, we all know it's a 24-7 uh, sort of, the microphone is always on, the camera is always on, so folks are always watching what the president and the college leadership are doing. And so in our language, in our actions, now I was gonna say you could participate in the uh, dumpster dive, that might be a little uh, far out, but uh, whether you are uh, doing things on the campus, you're participating with your sustainability councils, you are observing in a classroom, helping support faculty as they develop curriculum or they infuse sustainability principles into the curriculum, whatever the, the action is, as David says, we must, it's not, sustainability isn't something that is just left to the sustainability coordinator and ours, Thomas Williams is sitting here in the audience today. And I think that's one of the misconceptions that people think, oh, that's Thomas's job. Our role is to help convince everyone in our institutions that it's not a job, it's a way of viewing the universe and of viewing our role within the universe. And it is somewhat different than it has been in the past. The other, uh, the other thing that I think sometimes happens in our institutions is, as leaders, we assume that there's more or less a uniform awareness, understanding, and knowledge level. And I heard it today in our small group where we were watching the film and folks were saying, I didn't know that was true. And so there's always a, an opportunity to learn, of course, but I think as a leader, we must understand that, that all of the folks in our institutions are at many different places along a continuum of excellence, if you will, in, in terms of sustainability. And our job is to recognize where they are, 
help them to take that next step and to understand that sometimes getting to the goal is a, is, uh, can be a slow but an incremental process. And I think um, that's one of the things that I think is very, very important for us as colleges and universities, not only on our own or within our own institutions, but when we go out to our larger communities with our stakeholders, our donors, our communities at large, recognizing that those disparities exist there as well. A, a difference in knowledge, a difference in willingness, a difference in attitude, and it is our job to lead those conversations to help those communities be become more informed. Um, we have a wonderful role to play, and I'm proud and honored to, um, to play that role. Okay, John? John. Um, actually, just to talk very briefly about Northern Arizona University. When I became president... Can everybody hear John okay? Everybody no. hear me? No? Go flash. It's on flash. There it goes. It's on. It's on. Is that better? Say your your right. microphone's a little low. Okay. So let me stop the mic. How's that? When I joined Northern Arizona University in 2001, it already had a culture of. Um, across the entire campus, particularly in the academic division, of an interest in the environment and an interest in sustainability. And it goes back to the original group of people, actually, that Tony Cortese back there worked with on our campus, known as the Ponderosa Group, which were developing themes that would be inserted in every uh, general studies or liberal arts courses across the campus. Uh, but that group was actually building on a tradition of environmental sensitivity that has been true of the Flagstaff community for generations. And some of it is where we're located, in the mountains, uh, surrounded by an Navajo Indian reservation, representing 21 tribes. Part of it is uh, uh, the tradition of the Babbitts, and of course, Bruce Babbitt was Clinton's Secretary of the Interior. So there is a deep and abiding culture at NAU about the environment and about Okay, they, no, people can't hear you very well, John. So you're going to switch to this, and you're going to turn that one off. How's it? I think you turned it off. It's on. Can you hear me? Much better. All right. Um, so I was making the point about the nature of the university is environmental sustainability uh, is very much built into the culture of the institution. Um, and that gave us some advantages, especially when the American President's climate commitment was started, to take what we already had in play and then build from that. And while the President has a bully pulpit, the President also has the ability to try to keep everything in alignment. Um, it's often been said that on university campuses, often there are 400 different directions people want to go, and the, the task is to try to get people focused on a couple of main themes on any campus, and, and there the president can be very influential. So we've talked about undergraduate residential education as something that drives our institution. Sustainability is also something that drives our institution, and it doesn't just function on the academic side of the house, it functions um, uh, one interesting pattern we went through, we did a new master plan for the campus, and it was in the conscious thinking of everybody. This master plan has to reflect um, a sustainable campus into the future. And so we began to draw the buildings closer in so it could become a walking campus. We talked about bus routes so students could leave their cars and garages, and then we went on a, um, uh, the task of building new parking garages. Uh, because we knew that the carbon neutrality would eventually uh, become an issue and this was a, an important part of it. Our research um, goes to the heart of the area in which we, we live and so many of our faculty are working on specific research projects that relate to sustainability, whether it's related to water, wind and solar energy, uh, we have a very large forestry school that offers a PhD and many of those faculty are heavily involved in making uh, the American forest much safer uh, and, and they're actually producing solutions 
to, to some of the problems that we face ac ac across the, the climate uh, issues. Um, just one last thing that's interesting about Flagstaff, and I think gives us an advantage, the relationship between the university and the city government, the county government, we have an organization <coughs> called SETI, SETI, which is Sustainable Economic Development. Um, the culture thrives in the whole community, and so it makes it easier to move in, in many of the directions that we have been talking about. I think uh, I'm going to follow Tony Cortese's recommendation and try to switch to uh, engaging some of you all now to make certain that uh, Tony mentioned to me that often uh, folks don't have an opportunity to talk to the president of their college or the president of their university and they want to or there's some hierarchical constraint or, or, or whatever. It's actually, it's actually easier than that. You, you should, you should, you should uh, try it sometime. It's like, you know, the, you know actually, you'll actually get an answer. You know, people will actually say, oh, yeah, well, what about that idea or this idea? And so uh, why don't we start with uh, maybe focusing on what you guys would like to know about how we do the roles that we're particularly assigned, the teachers that are here in these, in these roles as uh, administrators, uh, or, or other things about where we're moving forward. I can tell you that from my perspective, 10 years into this job here, uh, you know, I, like NAU, I think like New Mexico, like Scottsdale Community College, the, 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 the culture in the West, I think, is much more open to uh, the concepts of sustainability than perhaps in the in the older and more established cities in the East. I was the founding director of a thing called the Earth Institute at Columbia University uh, a long time ago, and uh, getting that thing going back there was very challenging, uh, not only in the way that we were working with, with, uh, within the university, but, but working with the city and working with the, the state and uh, working on the East Coast and so forth. And things have been, there's, there's more of a culture of openness, more of a, of a willingness to change. And uh, you know that we're from this region, all of us in this, or most of us in this in this meeting. So, you know, I think the hardest challenge for me in advancing uh, all of this has been to uh, add to what already people think is a full plate. This notion that somehow we're already operating a full entity. Our time is already occupied. Our ideas have already been produced. Uh, the students are here. The financial burdens are here. And then finding an, a mechanism and convincing people that it's far from full because uh, as we move forward, we're going to be changing and morphing and moving in new directions. And this notion of the university becoming this sustainability teacher or this climate neutrality teacher through what we do and what we teach, that, just, that does require you to maybe think less about some other things and more about these things. And so uh, that's been the biggest, uh, the biggest challenge for me. And before we go to the questions, if each of you could just say very quickly what your biggest challenge has been. So, David? Uh, I think the biggest I think you're all right. Yeah. All Can you hear me now? Yeah. All right, good. I think the biggest challenge uh, that uh, we faced is, is getting this, uh, this, this whole paradigm across the entire uh, campus community. I mean, we, we have an academic program and we have students that are in that academic program. But how do you get the engineering students, the business students, how do you get everyone that comes and goes from the campus to buy into the idea that living sustainably and, and uh, adopting these, uh, these kinds of approaches to life is the way to be a better citizen? And th that's really th th goes back to this bigger teaching um, uh, concern of it, it's it's not just the students in biology. Um, I'm a conservation biologist. I had no trouble buying right. into this. Okay, that's what you do? <laughs> yeah, that's what I do. The question is, how do I get engineering students to do it? How do I get business students to do it? They're the ones doing the development. Right. And so I think that's part of the bigger challenge. John. John. Well, I I think the the challenge is to be sure that you involve the stakeholders on your campuses. Uh, I've been surprised the, at, at the, um, the direction even that our students on campus have taken. I mean, they're into these ideas in a big way. Um, and particularly on, in a residential campus, 
they can begin to, to really press the buttons with their fellow students. So, for example, they're the ones who convinced me into we, what we needed was um, a green fund, and, and the students then went out and, and, in a sense, set that up themselves. Our faculty are organized, actually faculty and staff from across the campus are organized into a sustainability caucus who at any given moment in time could have as many as 400 people that are connected to it, and they're connected by email, they have meetings. So that drives a very active agenda, and in a sense, um, I think my job is to be, get out of the way. <laughs> Jan? Thank you. I think um, I would echo the previous comments. I, in my original discipline uh, is, has its roots in human ecology, so in some ways I've come full circle. And I think the biggest challenge is the lack of uh, time that we have to devote to what appears to be a unique agenda. But uh, in Daniel Kors in the, off in the audience today, he's our uh, Scottsdale, he's the VP for Academic and Student Affairs. And we often use this phrase, it's not this or this, it's this and this. And so the challenge is to help folks understand this is an integrative process where we understand and as a president we articulate broadly, deeply, and often as they say, what it is to be a campus or an entity that's focused on sustain sustainability. And our district has adopted the triple bottom line model for our efforts, so it is that more holistic approach. And so to be on message, to frankly, as a president, you provide resources, you call the faculty and staff together and then get out of the way because they will, and the students, and they will um, do what is needed and um, really support them and be wet, ready to take risks. And sometimes um, willingness on your, one's own campus to take risks bumps into, in our case, um, a district lack or diminished willingness to take risks on some things. And you all know what I'm talking about. Um, but if we're ever going to really prepare the people that change the world, as the old ACE Solutions comment goes, we really must take risks on behalf of trying new things uh, to solve these problems. So I think the challenge depends on where you sit to, a, to, to some degree, but um, I think the opportunities far outweigh the challenges. They are, the latter are really of our own making, I think. Okay, Tony, you get the first question. So, uh, um, our handheld mic is now with President Hager. Um, so we're asking you to not be shy and to please come up and use this podium mic, which we unmuted. We figured out that was a problem. So Tony Cortese, you could come up and demonstrate how you come to the mic <laughs> <laughs> and ask a question. Um, and whoever else would like to ask a question should go up there now so that we can be efficient. Well, um, this is a great presentation, which is terrific. Uh, you are four committed presidents. Um, and uh, we don't have all the presidents in the, co the colleges and universities around the country that think this way. Uh, one of the things that would be helpful is um, Obviously, the President's Climate Commitment Network is designed to bring everybody together and help everybody get to a, a much better level and help each other. So the question uh, I have is, <clears throat> what are you doing on a regular basis to ensure that this culture shift is, in, its, in essence, what you're talking about is a culture shift. And it's a very deep culture shift. So how are you trying, how are you fostering that other than using the bully pulpit in are there specific ways that you're having people report to you, uh, or uh, that you're uh, making, you're talking with the board of regents or the board of trustees about it? Um, what are the mechanisms for, I guess, for institutionalizing um, what you're what you're doing? Because that's, I think, one of the questions that everybody here uh, has. So, so in in our in our case, uh, we created. Um, uh, a chief sustainability officer, he happens to be in the room, Ray Jensen over here, so that becomes then a corporate officer of the university that has an assigned role and the assigned role within our, within the university's objectives is to drive us to uh, uh, carbon neutrality by whatever means necessary, taking care of all of our electricity needs and what are we, a third of the way on our way to the, uh, to the uh, 
Not quite? Approaching a third. What, what percentage then, Ray? Probably closer to 15 to 20. Where we are? OK. So, we're, so that means we have 100 megawatts that we produce? Ray and I are going to debate right now. Yeah, OK. 15 megawatts out of what total? Forty, so that sounds a lot like a third, and so the the uh, uh, <laughs> right during the day, right during the day, and so and so so the, the 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 objective that Ray has is to drive our carbon footprint to the lowest possible level, day and night, which makes it harder, which drives that number down. Uh, you want to use batteries, <laughs> something, and so uh, the other thing that we have done in terms of uh, locking it in is that. Uh, We've already made policy shifts about what buildings we will build and, what, and how we will renovate and what their level of energy efficiency will be and where we're going and changing our business practices. So it's changing policy, changing practice, changing what we do. But more important than that, it's that we've set an institutional objective. Uh, and that is an institutional objective that's embedded across the whole, the whole institution. And so I don't, there's not much more we can, we can do other than that. We've made this an objective. So. Likewise, in Maricopa, we've done something similar with uh, starting at the district level, but I'll speak most uh, um, definitely about the college level. Again, we have a sustainability coordinator position, and that person actually reports directly to the president. That was done purposefully to send a message. We have a sustainability action council and an inclusiveness council. Again, the triple bottom line, the social justice part of this, which is very important. Both of those report directly to the president. They're full members of our um, college leadership team. And um, we think that, that that's one set of strategies that starts to drive that message. We also have fully engaged faculty in both integrative strategies for the curriculum as well as developing unique coursework and programs. And again, that's across the whole Maricopa district. Just very quickly, I've described NAU in terms of the sustainability is very much a part of the institution, but it is also a part of an administrative structure. So like other institutions, we have a sustainability director. We have people in every division uh, of the university who report to vice presidents who have a particular role to play. But we have committed uh, both to building buildings which are lead rated, to buying cars, um, uh, so, so that whether it's an electric vehicle or whatever, the, the fleet of automobiles reflects a sustainable emphasis. And, and I, I think that's how campuses do this, is at the highest level you have to have people committed and then people within each division who are responsible for being sure that they're tracking the extent to which the university's good on its work. We certainly follow these same sorts of uh, best practices, but there is uh, something else I might comment on. I think it's very important to get uh, the boards of the various institutions to understand what this is about. They are the ultimate policy makers at institutions. Uh, every policy uh, we, we uh, adopt at the university has to be approved by our board. And um, all of our uh, building requirements for our buildings, they have to be approved by boards. So I think one of the key roles uh, of a university president in this whole process is to make sure the board members are fully aware of why we're doing this and why it's important to do it the way we are and why we have sustainability officers and these various uh, infrastructures to, that, that will support it. Um, for example, every board meeting I give up and give the president's report. Next week, or the week after next, when I give the president's report, I'm going to report on this meeting. And I'm going to talk to the board about some of the ideas that came out in this meeting, some of what the other institutions are doing, and how our efforts in this area are contributing uh, to the national effort and what it means uh, uh, to the education of our students. So I think that's another dimension of this we have to keep in mind. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I had a question uh, on almost influence. Uh, in all the discussions we had over the last day and in the past, it's people in your position are so incredibly important at a very high level to, uh, to pull the rope. 
versus trying to push the rope from a sustainability director, someone who's just really caught fire. The board may be a little sleepy and the president of the college university might not be quite with the program yet. Um, my question to you is, is what are you doing individually on, and what would you suggest people in your position do to really influence others so that they like catch it? You know, for other college university presidents, you know, what, what can you do to, that would almost magnify what you have already learned and multiply that uh, almost exponentially in its impact at influencing and infecting other presidents because it's so influential as far as pulling the programs forward? Well, I mean, there's those universities that teach only and those that teach and do, and so they're just not the same. So I don't know. I, I, I don't make fun of them, but a little bit. <laughs> I, <laughs> just, just a little. I think you have to influence with integrity, but I do think that there's no substitute for um, if you can find those folks that are resistant or that are unsure, if you can get them to your campus, if you can show them the effects of what your policies have been, what your strategies have been, whether it's electric cars and fleet, but actually getting to the bottom line also. I think a lot of folks are convinced if you can, um, if you can carry the message that's con that convinces them that there is a suitable return on the investment, whether it's a small project, we have a, a cardboard bundling uh, disposal process, it's 6,000 bucks up front, we get 500 bucks every time we ship a batch off, four times four a year, so in three years it pays itself off, but it models the way. And the other thing I would say is that, again, back to students, students and faculty especially, um, they tell fabulous stories. And it's very difficult for anyone who has started out as a, perhaps a classroom teacher and is now a president to ignore or dismiss the story of a student or a group of students who've made a difference. And so they're, your, they're one of your most uh, convincing resources, I think. Just, just two points very quickly. Um, one is, is it, it, from the position of the president, to, you've established sustainability as one of the major focus points of the university. You have to remember that universities are in constant swirl, and there are new people coming in sometime in, in uh, very high positions that have influential role, and you have to keep telling the story as new faculty, new students um, come into the institution. The other is to use the opportunities when they're presented. So we're going before our Board of Regents, I think it's this next meeting, to present a project uh, in which we're uh, uh, signing a contract with Noresco, which are going to come in and look at uh, all of our buildings for energy efficiency It'll cost us money up front, but we know that that money will eventually return um, to the institution because we will be more energy efficient uh, after they finish the project. That is going to be an, a, a really good story to tell the Board of Regents, who haven't been probably as focused on this particular agenda. Well, our, our board works a little bit differently where we, we don't have the same kinds of policies relative to buildings and things like that, they, they, we, d we just don't have those same kinds of things. We report to the same board in Arizona. You know, one thing I've tried to do is um, I make a lot of phone calls to my colleagues. Uh, John, what you just talked about, we started about uh, two or three years ago, and the savings have just been phenomenal. So I've called every president uh, of any university in the state of New Mexico and suggested they look into establishing a similar kind of, uh, of uh, program. And I've done that with colleagues all around the country. I, I carry a little briefing document here about how successful our energy conservation program is. And when people say, hey, I'm struggling to contain costs, I pull it out and give it to them because it works. Mm -hmm. um, in my own case, too, uh, I use my academic work. Uh, I wrote my first paper on sustainable development in 1991. I wrote a chapter in a book uh, th th called Conservation and Sustainable Development. I still give presentations at scientific meetings. I still go to scientific meetings. And uh, I, I try to present in the context of my own research. 
and uh, my own teaching uh, this idea as well. I don't know that that helps much with other university presidents because there aren't many other university presidents with my background. But I think it does help uh, other academics and, uh, and young students see that it's a subject that I'm interested in continue to talk about. Thank you. Um, I've watched the development of the program at ASU since uh, for, for a very long time now. It's been very intriguing. And one of the things that stands out, I think, is in many cases, certainly in our case, our chancellor understands the notion of sustainability. Uh, I think the students really understand the notion of sustainability. And uh, I'd, I'd be interested in some of your experiences. In many cases, how do you drag the faculty uh, kicking and screaming with very distinct um, boundaries in departments and colleges uh, along with anything, sustainability is one of those themes, but certainly there are others. Um, how, do, how can we uh, utilize um, both the, res the resources and the, the sentiments within the faculty, but move in directions um, such as this? Well, I mean, I, th I think that the best way to move things forward with the faculty to is, engage, is to engage the faculty on an intellectual basis. That is to, to focus on the intellectual argument about why sustainability should be a value uh, that we should be striving to work toward as an institution, that sustainability should be a theme of our educational uh, foundation. That, uh, and, and so you make that case. And so in our particular case at ASU, we have brought in outside speakers uh, to have discussions and uh, debates. We have, uh, I have written a number of pieces making the case for sustainability as an educational or pedagogical objective. That is sustainability as an objective itself to work toward. Uh, why it's as important as, you know, we have no arguments about teaching about justice. Uh, we have no argument about teaching about the importance of the concept of liberty. Uh, or uh, free speech or any of the other concepts. And so what we've tried to do in our particular case here at ASU is have an intellectual discussion about sustainability as a, as a value that the institution should hold as a part of its core set of values that it's engaged in teaching and doing research about and projecting and, and living. And so in our particular case, and I think this would work at other places, uh, in our case that's not everything that we've done, but that's the basic element of the approach that we've taken. I, I would comment just very briefly is that you have to, in a sense, encourage not just with the bully, bully pulpit, but you encourage faculty and staff in various areas by really, when an idea comes up, let's say for a new academic program, so you'll be developing this next fall an interdisciplinary PhD, around these very topics. Well, somebody's got to put money on the table. And what, because if, in fact, sustainability is a core mission, then you have to put the money up there when the ideas come forward. And the Noresco project is another example of that. It's going to cost us money up front, but we're making a statement about how important this really is to the institution. And let me just add to that. So, so, so uh, a few years ago in the economics department, they were interested in expanding the economics department and the central administration, at least in the way we manage our budgets, is responsible for allocating the resources for that expansion. We said, well, sure, we'll, we're interested in helping economics to become a bigger and a better department, but we have one caveat. 30% of the hires will be in environmental economics. Yeah. I'd yeah. like to make a comment, so. too, when we uh, were discussing with Kellogg Foundation supporting a faculty uh, chair in the area of sustainability. It required quite a bit of matching funds, and most of that was directed out of my office. Mm -hmm. yeah. And as a result of that, we were able to establish a very nice chair and keep a very excellent scholar engaged in this. Um, but I w I've been president of three universities, and I think, John, you said something earlier that really stuck in my mind. The culture of the institution has a lot to do with how easy it is to move uh, to move in this direction. I can tell you the three institutions where I've been, it was much easier in New Mexico than either Oklahoma or Texas, where you have just a, 
you have a strong oil and gas, uh, a different mentality. And it's, uh, it's really not been difficult at all to get the faculty at the University of New Mexico really engaged in this, much easier than at the other two institutions. speak to um, how you deal with growth and wanting your institution to grow in the face of um, climate commitments that aren't adjusted for growth? That's, that's something question. that I've heard from um, kind of our top leadership that that's an issue that's it's really hard to deal with. So, so we've added um, 25,000 students since 2002 and we will add 14,000 more students to our base between now and 2019. And that just makes Ray's job harder because, because we have to grow and expand the institution and our functionality while at the same time figuring out how to lower our carbon footprint. So it, we just make that as a part of our, of our structure, part of the way that we, I mean, it's, it, it, that's a part of it because the country is growing, everybody's growing, you know, the more kids are going to be going to college, more kids are going to be going to community college. All the universities here are going to see growth and they'll experience growth. And so you just have to figure it out in that context. That makes it more challenging. You have to think about every building that you're building and how you're doing it and how you design them and what your infrastructure is going to be. And, and you know, maybe if you're going to th even think about buildings in the same way, maybe you'll do think you know, you'll have different pedagogical models for teaching and so forth. And so it just becomes a part of the whole, the whole thing. I would echo that comment, especially that, <clears throat> excuse me, as we all face growth, it is uh, challenging our notions about how we use our physical spaces. Um, some of the colleges are older than others, and so it's not a matter sometimes of only building new, and Maricopa is committed to building it to um, lead silver standard, uh, but also your renovations, which are more difficult to do in a sustainable way in many ways, but uh, it is thinking differently about the use of the space, and that's in, an entire topic in and of itself, but you all know about online education and uh, the hybrid models that are proving to be very, very effective. So it's, it's, a, it's not an easy, there's not an easy answer to that question. Just to add to your comments, um, I often say this on campus, the challenge is we're all going to have more students, we're likely going to have fewer faculty per the number of students we have, right. we have to maintain quality, and, and so ultimately what, what happens is we have to rethink the enterprise, and, and often that means rethinking how we offer academic programs, because there, otherwise there is no other way to, to to answer all of the issues that are being put on our tables at every university in this country. Can I just say something uh, to piggyback on that? I mean, the word collaboration is known to all of us, but I think this very challenge really calls all of us to think more collaboratively. And uh, just on behalf of the Maricopa Community Colleges, and I know other community colleges as well, all across the United States, we are collaborating more successfully and more thoroughly with the university partners and recognizing that perhaps we have some physical space that's unused that the university needs to use and so on and so forth. So um, I think uh, whoever said a crisis is a terrible thing to waste, I don't mean to minimize the, the negative aspects of any crisis, but it is a situation that causes us to be more creative in how we solve our problems and working together. In many ways, this is our biggest challenge. I mean, in public education, as important as higher education is globally now, we're all going to continue to grow. That's just, it's just inconceivable to me that we want. And so uh, collaboration, networking, sharing best practices, we all are going to be struggling with this. How do we manage this growth in a, uh, in a paradigm of sustainable development? And I think globally, we're going to be doing the same thing. That's why higher education is so important in this context. We can be uh, the great teachers in this area and the great examples. Well, uh, I want to thank you all, uh, but I uh, just wanted to end with a, with a uh, kind of a question and a, and a uh, thought. It is, it's clear to me that the paradigm shift we're talking about with respect to the way you have to think about education, right? 
just as an example, Michael, I love what you guys did at ASU by, by getting all your different schools to focus on some of the major challenges that we face and organize their research and organize the education around that. Uh, that that's, a, that's a wonderful new direction. And uh, so there are many dimensions to, to uh, what we're talking about here. In essence, um, David, you just made the case that, that uh, which I always uh, argue is that if higher education doesn't find a way to lead to create a healthy, just, and sustainable society, who's going to do it? We're the ones that train all the people that are going to become the future politicians, the future business leaders, you know, the, the future presidents. And if they don't understand the, the broad principles of health, social, economic, and, and uh, ecological sustainability, instead of just thinking about it as the environmental piece, I don't think we have a chance. So um, a couple of things come, uh, come to mind. One is that, uh, that you, know, you know, you all know this better than anybody else. That any CEO of any organization that wants to get the organization to go in a different direction talks about it all the time, over and over again, just like advertising. It has to be there all the time. It has to be a core value. It has to be uh, repeated. And, uh, and, and it also needs to be something that, that it is made into the institute, not only into the institutional culture, but with specific ways of trying to get the academic piece to work on it and the operational side. And you're all trying to do that, which is terrific. Um, we're in uncharted territory in that we've never had to think about how to live sustainably on this planet at the level that we do now, because we've never been big enough in numbers or in economic prowess to really be the, the, the primary determinants of the habitability of the planet for ourselves and every other species. This has never happened. And that's happening with 25% of the world's population consuming 75% of the world's resources. So this shift that we have to make is such a deep one that um, it, it, I think it, it requires a level of collaboration among the colleges and universities that we've never seen before. A great start, we think, is the President's Climate Committee. But I think it has to go on regionally. And so what we tried to do with this symposium was to bring together many of the schools who are working on these similar problems at various levels of, of, uh, of responsibility and pieces and all of that. And uh, what I was wondering about was the possibility of the universities in this region actually repeating this and setting up some sort of collaborative way to think about everything around purchasing renewable energy, energy efficiency and conser uh, conservation, um, uh, you know, faculty development workshops, or whatever it's going to take to, you know, across the region so that you can become a model not only for sustainability in society, but a model for how higher education uh, could, uh, you know, could lead this effort. So I just wondered what you thought about, about, that, uh, about that idea because we think, you know, after all the work we've done in Second Nature with, uh, with the President's Climate Commitment nationally, it really comes down to whether or not the schools, not only individually, but in the regions where you have similar problems, you have similar cultures, you have similar challenges, if you could come together and, and do this as a model, we could really probably show this as something that other regions of the country could do, and then we could grow this organically pretty quickly. So that was just a No, David. I, I think it's a, a great idea, and I, uh, Michael said something earlier about we all live in the West, yep. uh, and we've got certain challenges because of where we are, and we also have <coughs> a, a cultural understanding that is sort of common. And as I mentioned to you earlier, the University of New Mexico will be happy to host this group uh, next spring in a similar endeavor. And I think, uh, you know, it's like anything else. If it's a good idea, you try it two or three times, it'll get legs. And there are a lot of things we could do collaboratively. I would love to do some faculty exchanges, for example, with your institutions. I'd love to hear more about his green fund. Uh, uh, there are just a number of things that we can do here institutionally through collaboration that would make that a very good idea. I, I, I think it's a very good idea. I mean, I think you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, one of the things that uh, I think would be good for some set of universities to come to an agreement that says, yes, sustainability is a value that we're all working toward and we're going to learn from each other. In fact, I, I gave a talk not too long ago where 
I was reminded uh, during the talk about uh, this uh, philosopher that had a big impact on me by the name of Phil Kitcher. And Phil is one of the most famous philosophers of science uh, probably in the last 200 years. And he's still alive and still writing and still having a big impact. And he wrote a book called Science, Truth, and Democracy in which he basically condemned the universities for being overly amoral. Not immoral, but amoral. That is, without moral purpose, without moral compass. And what that meant was that they did science just for the sake of science, not for some objective that they were working toward. And so, and so conservation biology, picking David's field, is an, er an area of science with a stated objective, whereas most areas of science do not have that. And most areas of academia don't necessarily have that. Some do, some don't. And so this area of sustainability and what we're doing as teachers and how we're teaching and why we're teaching and so forth, I think it would be good for a group of universities to get together and figure out how to embrace that. And, and you know, meeting next year in Albuquerque, that would be, that would be uh, great. And of course, we at Second Nature would be very happy to help you just think, think it through and have us uh, you know, support it uh, with some ideas. Because I, honestly, I can't see how we can get the level of transformation unless we begin to get groupings of colleges and universities to do this. Um, you know, uh, one of the challenges we've had in some uh, of the uh, elite universities, and I'll be candid about that, and that is that um, I, I think many You mean elite in that they don't let many students in? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I mean, uh, what we consider to be, uh, yeah, yeah. I think uh, some of the, uh, the larger research institutions uh, in the country, many of which have signed the President's Climate Commitment, we've got a bunch that haven't. And uh, I think one of the challenges is many of them think that they are both necessary and sufficient to move society in a new direction. And when I think they're necessary but not sufficient, because with this it needs to be a transformation of the entire higher education system. Many of them are pridefully amoral. <laughs> yeah, but because, and part of it is because we don't understand the consequences of what we do. And if sustainability is about anything, it's about making the invisible consequences of the way we live on a daily, ba daily basis Visible. So I want to thank you all for thank you very much. But more importantly, thank you for your leadership um, because uh, without the leadership of the, of the presidents, and you've been very bold, and uh, we appreciate it very much because, and future generations really appreciate it. So thank you very much, and uh, thank you for, for, I hope this was a useful discussion for, uh, for you as members of the, uh, the symposium. And uh, thanks very much, and uh, we'll be talking to you soon. Thank you.